and it is one fight that you will never forget. Five minutes and twenty seconds of awesomeness. So you know, in South Park, there is a fight between Timmy and Jimmy, J- Timmy and Jimmy that is a scene for scene, shot for shot complete remake of the fight from they live yeah you know this is only supposed to be 30 seconds long no yeah they went to carpenter and they're like we can make this better while well, his wrestling experience and everything i'm not surprised he did that they rehearsed it for three weeks in carpenter's backyard that's amazing o- only fake hits were the face and groin that yeah. can't be true they'd be I, dead i don't know right the, Just the, the whole thing <laughs> the fight scene is incredible welcome to buzz in the tower a podcast dedicated to the movies of the 1980s Our mission is to take you on a most excellent adventure through time. Buzz in the Tower is so much more than a podcast. It's the map to One-Eyed Willie's treasure. And all you have to do is sit back, listen, and repeat after me. Klaatu! Barata! Buzz in the Tower answers the questions you didn't even know you had. Like who would win in a fight, John Rambo or Hans Gruber? Or who is dreamier, Jake Ryan or Marty McFly? So as we rank, debate, and offer fresh takes of the best of the best from 80s cinema, please remember, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and listen to a podcast once in a while, you could miss it. Don't forget to subscribe to Buzz in the Tower on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. For bonus content, you can find us on all social media channels by searching our handle at Buzz in the Tower. For more podcasts, information, or to contact us with topics you'd like us to talk about, visit our website, buzzinthetower.com. That's B-U-Z-Z-N, thetower.com. Buzz in the Tower is brought to you by Verde Media. Max, I couldn't be happier with the way our website looks. So good. Yeah. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at our website yet, you need to right away. These guys, website development, online marketing, they are outstanding. Am I exaggerating at all? It is so choice. If you have the means, I highly recommend having them build you one. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Um, Look, they're the best of the best. And working with John, uh, their owner, a self-admitted 80s martial arts movie nerd was an absolute joy. Is that why you said the best of the best? That is why I said that was a tip of the hat to John. Um, they're more than our sponsor. They're our partner. And if you are looking to build a website, they are the group to go to, uh, find their link on our website and check them out. Verde media. Today's episode, top 11 eighties sci-fi movies, part one. Science fiction. The Final Frontier. These are the favorite sci-fi movies of Buzz in the Tower. It's two-part mission to explore 80s movies, to seek out new facts, rank, and debate, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. I'm Mo Shapiro. Joining me as always, the Spock to my Admiral Kirk, Max Sanders. And with that, Con! Live long and prosper. <laughs> that was very Spockish. <laughs> I'm trying. You did a great Spock. I'm more, I'm more Kirk. <laughs> We're all more Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> how, can you, how can you host a podcast and not be like hamming it up, you know? <laughs> and by the way, Kirk is so close to Christopher Walken, but I almost found myself in the intro yeah, you sliding gotta, into you Walken. Yeah, into it. Yeah, I, I should have. I should have been like, friends, <laughs> boldly go. I, you know, yeah, that's... You know who's considered for the role? Really? No. Well, all right, well, there you go. <laughs> you and your false positives. <laughs> Max, we... Um, finally. Finally sci-fi. It's, it's interesting when we were going over the movies and even just talking about doing science fiction. I never considered myself like a lover of sci-fi until what? I realized that all of my favorite movies are basically yeah, sci-fi movies. They're the best. They're the most. You go to the movie, you have your popcorn, your eyes gloss over and your mouth goes half open. Yeah. Yeah. Sci-fi. It's really the other interesting thing is like a traditional classic action film. Yeah. They're typically not trying to make any point. No. Sci-fi is, a- sci-fi is always like 
Yeah. Bad, bad government. You're hurting the earth. Like how humanity the, deals with chaos, tragedy. Yeah. Dystopian. You yeah. can't watch any sci-fi movie without like the, the intro being like dystopian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, earth 2019. Yeah. yeah. It's unbelievable how consistent that is. Biggest fears, wildest dreams. Yeah. Uh, so as always, before we even talk anything about the show. Do you believe in aliens? You know, it's a good question. Maybe for another time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I believe that there's got to be something, sure, but I don't know that I believe that it's the little gray. No, there's a predator dudes. out there. Yeah, the pre- I believe more in the predator. Have, than they, the alien. have they named the predator alien? Like you know how xenomorphs and aliens. Like, is there a predator name or is it just the predator? I have no idea. I don't have answers to your deep questions. Philosophical questions. Very deep philosophical questions. They'll That's keep what me up. Is about keep me up at night, haunted, thinking about these. Why things. are we here? We're here to talk about the T-shirt you're wearing. That's why we're here. Oh yeah. And it's interesting because it's going to immediately lead into a bigger conversation about our top 11 list. And just for those listening, Max and I pride ourselves on being different than other podcasts. And we, we're not a huge fan of top 10 lists, which is why we did 11. I'm a fan. <laughs> you're, yeah. Yeah, you because can... you're you're the you're the rat in the maze that loves to hit the feeder bar. I do. Right? You're like food. Food, water, yeah, food, light, water, blue light. Yeah, the blue light. I, just sometimes. You I, said eleven. I was like, Get. <laughs> yeah, I know your OCD kicked in, and you were like, we can't do this. But we have eleven. We also have eleven because, well, we'll get to that in a minute. So your shirt is, I'm jealous. Just Kill me, like, I'm here. Yeah. yeah, you have the predator. Shirt. Yes, it is a colorful blue shirt with our friend the predator. Well, it's the like, it's the. What's it called? Infrared light. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. very cool. Is it infrared? No, that's not right. right no, infrared's right. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah cool. you're right. Cool. Uh, it's a very cool shirt. I. You have the subdued one. I do. I'm wearing the They Live Consume shirt. The distress gray yeah. with the black. Which, but we got lucky in the shirts we got because it ties perfectly into our sci fi topic today. That yeah, doesn't always happen. Yeah. yeah. So that was great. 80stees.com. Also, Max, if you're looking for a gift for me, their Father's Day shirts are up. Have you seen them yet? No. They're really cool. There's a couple Darth Vader ones that are like hilarious. <laughs> and uh, that's if you're looking for a gift for your dad, mm-hmm. that's the place to go for Father's Day. Like what what dad doesn't love half the stuff, if not more, that's on 80stees.com. Darth Vader's probably the best one. He's the best dad ever, right? Is that who you role model after? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Death grip my kids. That's good. <laughs> 80stees.com. Please Please check them out. Uh, we're always uh, happy to have them as our sponsor. The shirts are just incredible. Keep them coming. Let's hop into our topic. Let's do it. The first tricky part, I live in a constant state of nervousness. And you know this, when you and I talk about topics, when I get like freaked out that someone's going to, I almost envision someone showing up at my doorstep and being like, how could you not put this movie in here? And it's I'm so like, I'm weird. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm neurotic about everything else. Topics, you lose your mind. I do. I do. Be- I just want to get in here and do 15 topics. At I, I know. I know. I, Top I, 10 feet. I Let's am the worst. Top 10 feet. Yeah. <laughs> I got a couple friends that like that topic. <laughs> weird, weird fr- <laughs> one in particular I know. So moving on. The tricky part about how we did this is, and I'm gonna do my best to explain it, but a little bit of it is not a little bit of it. The bottom line is these are our eleven favorite sci-fi movies. So however you want to slice or dice that, this is what you and I sat down and said these are our eleven favorite sci-fi movies. However, there are movies like Back to the Future and Predator yep. that are widely considered sci-fi movies. You wouldn't debate that they're not sci-fi movies, but Predator is an action film first. Yep. Sci-fi movie second. You could argue slasher movie. Kind yeah, of a little bit. Yeah. Well, same with a couple that we picked. But sci-fi is is not what holds that movie up. Yep. Like if if the Predator was replaced by a band of uh you know mercenaries, you still could have that movie. Sure. It, it wouldn't be as good, but you could still have it. That'd be pretty cool. Who, yeah. who would lead the other team? Uh, Max, focus. Okay. Focus. Right. The, Seagal. The, yeah, right. There you go. Seagal. The, I mean, even looking at, um, what was the other example? Back, Back to, to the, the future. future. Back to the Future is like a comedy more so than it's a sci-fi film, yeah. even though obviously time travel, science is in family, it. Family movie too. Yeah. 50s yeah, yeah. movie. So we, we tried to pick movies that just felt to you and I like sci-fi movies. Like 75% sci-fi. At yeah. Least. Yeah. And then there's other movies like you, like Willow and Empire Strikes Back. Those are fantasy movies. Yeah. And then sci-fi. Like there, there's that element of fantasy first and then sci-fi. Yeah, magic. So, if you get magic, you're not, I'm not sure you're really in sci-fi at that point. Right. So that's a great point, right? Because the Star Wars films is all like the force, which is magic. And Although midichlorians, I mean, it is scientific. Yeah, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> it depends. I can't believe when they said that, I was like, why are yeah, you doing this Don't to ruin me? that, please. <laughs> uh, and then Willow, obviously, was actual magic. There's yeah. magic wands involved. So Kilmer's face. <sighs> 
Val Kilmer. All right. So that's kind of how we narrowed our list down. That's kind of how we did this. Yeah. But um, apologies up front to anybody who disagrees with us. But this is how we came up with our 11 favorite. No apologies for me. Max unforgivingly will throw his answers out there. So are we ready to jump in? Yes. All right. So our first movie, it's interesting because our first movie is one that I would have argued we could have put in the top grouping. So for part one, we're doing 11 through six. Yep. And then part two, which will be next week, we'll do our top five. At number 11, um, we've got Akira. I, I love this movie. Now, I, I'm also a big Dragon Ball Z fan, and I also love animation. It's so weird. I never knew that about you too. Yeah, like a couple of weeks ago. I know, I know. And like Akira, okay, before, <laughs> this is the problem with this episode is I, I'll nerd out pretty hard on a lot of these movies. Yeah. Akira probably is the one that I would nerd out on the most. Seriously? Yeah, there's the relevance of it. So this is a movie where I have no idea who's seen it and who hasn't. So Akira, uh, in 1988, the Japanese government drops an atomic bomb on Tokyo. Looks so cool when it happens. Yes, I'll, I'll Although we'll talk about that a little bit later because that's not entirely what happened. But after some ESP experiments on children go awry. Little blue people. Yeah. ESP obviously being, what does ESP stand for? I'm, I was going to do it's an tele, it's tele, joke. It's, tele, it's telepath, like yeah, yeah. telepaths, but yeah, I don't yeah. remember what ESP stands for. Yeah. Um, so in uh, 2019, which is wild because we're in 2021. Extra sensory perception. Thank you. There you go. Did you Google that or do no. you remember that? Look, Look at hands. you. All right. Look, Look at my hands. It's magic. <laughs> 31 years after nuking the city, uh, Kaneda, a bike gang leader, tries to save his friend Tetsu from a secret government plot. He battles, anti, yeah, he, he battles anti-government activists, greedy politicians, irresponsible scientists, and a powerful military leader until Tetsu supernatural powowers suddenly manifest. Like it's, hit, he, get, he gets hit, it gets in a biking accident. But a final battle is fought in Tokyo and uh, exposes the experiments and the secrets. And we meet Akira. Here's the thing about this movie: why I get kind of tongue-tied on it, and why it's such a big deal. Well, so it's like every science fiction trope in one. It is widely regarded as one of the best science fiction films ever. Yeah. Even if even if you take out the animated part, as far as animated films, it changed animation. Yeah. So the, there's a ton of incredible pieces of information about this movie. I don't well, they, know. They used 160,000 still pictures, which right. is unheard of. Right. And, At the time. And yeah. a $10 million budget. Yeah. They had like seven major corporations yeah. in, in, Jap in Japan actually like help fund this thing. You think Whalen Corp helped? No, nah, well, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> but you got to remember too, this is 1988, right? Yeah. Like 10, like million, 10 million is a lot of money. Yeah. And especially for an animated movie. Well, think about uh, when we talked about The Secret of Nim. that was 6.5 million. Right. And, and that, that was that, huge. Yeah. And that's that had like muscle behind it. Yeah. Yeah, Bluth. It had the, right. the Bluth and, army. Because you have to remember, too, it's America's known for film. Yep. So when you make a film in America or for distribution in America, it's a whole different ballgame. This was not initially built that way. No. You know, they they brought this to Spielberg and Lucas and they passed on it because, up, really? because they said it would never sell in the United States. Uh, at the time, I mean, it's gross. That Cronenberg thing he turned into at the end. Yeah, I wanted to like hug my toilet. The Ugh. the visual the visual imagery of this movie is striking. Yeah, I think the, one of the most fun aspects of our podcast we go back and watch all these movies. Yeah, and I just watching Akira. It doesn't feel like it was made in 1988. No, it, it feels like it was made yesterday. Yeah, the, I mean, just it's beautiful. I mean, yes, it's gory, but like the the cinematography of the animation is incredible. They used 327 colors for this movie. Did you know there's 327 colors in existence? No, it was at the time it was the most ever used, and it was because there's so many uh, scenes that were at night and dark yeah. that it, it required 50, 50 colors were created for this film. Another thing they did, which I would highly recommend when you watched it, did you watch it dubbed over? Did you watch it with subtitles? Subtitles. Good. That's the way to watch it yeah. because what you also get an appreciation for is something they did that was very different is they recorded all of the audio prior to animating. And when you That's do it, yeah. it's very different. So typically what they do is you do the animation and then the, the voice actor comes in and kind of speaks while watching it. Yeah. So the sync issues are more difficult in this one all of the animators had all of the audio so they were literally drawing to the pace and cadence of the person talking which is why when you watch this again more appreciated when you watch the subtitles because you can actually see in their native language speaking yeah but it's why it's so smooth and clean and actually ties together. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the beginning intro, we were talking about how all these great sci-fi movies have like a meaning behind them, right? This is every meaning. This was a big middle finger to the government, yep. to nuclear power, to... Uh, and Scientists it, pushing the envelope. Absolutely, absolutely. To religion. It was very like anti-religion. Just the the praying at the altar of Akira, Akira and yeah. not really even knowing what Akira is. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly enough too, you know, throughout this entire movie, for again, for those who haven't seen it, we gave kind of 
of the quick high level. Basically, what happens in this movie is if you ever watch Stranger Things, Stranger Things basically is this, right? Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it, right? Stranger Things is about experiments that are done on children that have special powers. Yeah. And then those children either kind of escape or enact in a different universe of superpower. I mean, isn't yeah, that this, kind of this is more cyberpunk, anti-government, the future is screwed, Blade Runner, which big, you haven't seen. By yeah, the way. I know. I know. <laughs> we don't tell people about movies I Exposing haven't seen. Low. I don't expose me. I hate that. Uh, I, no, I'm not. Of all the movies I've seen, that is not one yeah. of them. So in this movie, you're in this dystopian. I'm going to use that word so many times today because yeah. I love it. Um, Tokyo and you have this gang of bikers. There's two gangs of bikers, capsules and the clowns. Clowns are scary. Clowns are very scary. So in this game, you have Kaneda and Tetsuo, right? Yeah. So Kaneda is kind of older the brother, alpha. Brother. Yeah. yeah. Kaneda, uh, Kaneda's the Don't older. Don't make fun of me. Kaneda's the, Kaneda's the older brother leader of this biker gang. And then Tetsuo is like the weaker, more frail. So he gets in a accident, which results in him learning of his special powers. Yeah. Creepy power. As he learns these powers, he's taken to a government facility where there are three other children that are like gray are and children? sickly. Yeah. I don't even know. But they have the same special powers. Yep. You know, the, the rumors of this thing called Akira, right? So everybody thinks like there's a, a subset of the culture that thinks that this atomic bomb that happened in 1988 had something to do with Akira. Yep. But nobody really knows what Akira is. Everybody's looking for Akira. Everybody is praying to Akira, but nobody knows. It's the sci-fi. It's the mystery. It is. And as they start activating Tetsuo's powers. Right. He determines that he needs to find and learn what Akira is. It's like something in him. He's not like it's. it's he's not really being controlled by himself. It's he's like this, drawn. He's yeah, drawn the, to yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it basically, which is the best for science. Yeah, guy. basically finds out like Akira was one of these children that had immense power and basically destroyed Tokyo in '88. So yeah. what, what they did with Akira is they chopped Akira up into lots of small pieces and, <laughs> and freeze dry the career. Yeah. I'm probably not doing justice to the depth of the story, but it's disenfranchised. There's, youth, a, lot, there's a lot of going it's, on. There is. Yeah. It's, I could dive into this a lot deeper. We have a bunch of other movies to get through. I'll yeah. simply say this. If you love science fiction, this has to be on your list of movies to watch. Well, the cool, I mean, to give like a one microcosm of how yeah. detailed and fun this is mm-hmm. when Tetsuo goes up to destroy a satellite, they make it silent because space is silent. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. A little things like that that like are just these beautiful moments when you're just quiet for sci-fi. You're like, my god, the power of like the hallucinations when he's in the hospital. The melting bear. Yeah. yeah. Oh my yeah. god, yeah. it's just it, and it's so well done. That's everything too. The the graphic nature of the a lot of times both in movies and in animation, you see the directors and the actors they move away from kind of the graphic nature of violence. Yeah. And this just embraces it. It's so real. Sci-fi goes for it. They, they really do. It's yeah. it's great movie so it's always grosser than you think like you love it but there's this 10 percent where you're like i'm gonna vomit yeah so our (laughs) our consensus our consensus number 11 our top 11 is akira go watch it you'll love it again we could talk about it forever i'm trying to see one last thing i might have other facts too as i'm like running off this jacket is that what they based the matrix on the blue pill red pill because you got the blue and red pill on the back of them i tried to look it up i couldn't find it boy that's a great question right it's a great jacket it's a huge deal movie yeah um you know like kanye is a huge fan of akira one of his music videos actually takes clips from Akira and has it in it. Yeah, Jordan Peele is going to remake it, and I, it's not coming to fruition. They were going to do a live action. Oh, is that what you're referring to? I think I, I know Jordan Peele was signed on to direct okay. uh, on Akira. Okay, yeah, they were talking about doing a live action, which I don't even know how they could do it. I mean, now I guess it, they could. Nowadays, nowadays, yeah. nowadays, you're right, they could. But they it could was avatar oh, it. it was wild. I'm good on facts. I just love that it is. If you if you categorize it, we talked about how like there's comedy, sci-fi. And this is Japanese animated post-apocalyptic cyberpunk action film. Yeah, this is 99 percent sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. yeah although yeah. it's kind of funny at points too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. there's the the little romance. Yeah, it, yeah. That, it almost has like a this. Follow me on this. You're gonna think I'm crazy. It almost has like a little John Hughes. Use, you know, uh, older brother, younger brother, crush on girl, this subtext is, this is story. Worse than you're saying Ursula is the predator of the Disney world. Ursula is the predator <laughs> of the Disney world. <laughs> We're going to avoid it. Stop it. All right, fine. Yeah. Well, all right, I'm done. What do you got? Anything? Let's end with a quote. End with a quote. Yeah. What's your quote? The future is not a straight line. It's filled with many crossroads. There must be a future we can choose for ourselves. Your serious voice makes me super uncomfortable. It's very sci-fi. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You got to be serious when you, there's some serious sci-fi quotes. I agree. Uh, number 10. Yeah. Max, what do we have for number 10? This is a goofball movie. I love it though. <laughs> I do. I like this movie a lot. Give me Tron. 1982 Tron. Written and, so uh, written, written and directed by Steven Lisberger. He might as well be called Tron because he doesn't do anything else. Tron <laughs> Lisberger. <laughs> he literally, he's only directed Tron movies. Uh, Jeff Bridges, Bruce Boxleather. Did I, I say that right? I think so. Yeah. All right. Uh, David Warner, and uh, Warner, excuse me, Cindy Morgan and Barnard Hughes and Dan Shore. Sound I, about right? I know two of those people. I, I, I figured I'd give them their uh give them their love so yeah. uh max tell me about this movie 
Computer hacker abducted into a digital world and forced to play gladiatorial games where a brave computer program helps him save humanity from AI domination of master control. Well, there you have it. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. Who made this movie? Was this Disney? Yes. Yeah, it was Disney. That's right. So I'm a, I'm a big Jeff Bridges fan. Oh, my God. Yeah. So his I, voice. I, yeah. And this because, is a, man, <laughs> this is a, this is another movie going back and watching it where I'm like, wow, I haven't seen this since I was a little kid. And it is there's a goofy element to it. Right. Yeah. So but the thing that's cool about Jeff Bridges, Flynn, I feel Flynn. like, yeah, Flynn, I feel like the dude, this is this is the dude, this is right? The dude, yeah. it, it, like this the super the chill, version, yeah. like, yeah. I, you know, I'm going to hack the company, man. <laughs> when he's messing the with rug master. really made the room, yeah. bro. <laughs> when he's messing with master control. And he's master controls like you can't stop me, and then he goes, eh, 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 <laughs> and Jeffrey is just laughing his butt off. <laughs> so Tron is Tron's pretty wild, right? Because at the time, going back to us talking about the Matrix, there's elements of this movie that were clearly ripped off and used for the Matrix, like the idea that programs are humans, right? So yeah. like you go back to what was it, the third Matrix when they're in that kind of like station, the train station where like uh, old programs come and new oh, programs yeah, yeah. come in. That I, I thought that was that's an interesting connection. Oh, I thought that was borrowed from Tron for sure. Yeah. So you get into the game and the users are kind of like gods to these programs yeah. and these programs are acting out their programmed role and that's their life. Their life is to do what the user has programmed them to do. But some of them are shifting. Right. Yeah, which is And cool. it's all changing. I love Dumont, the little fat toad guy. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Um, and like half Yoda, half Jabba the Hutt. It's, it's kind of cool, right? Because you have the beginning of the movie where Jeff Bridges has been fired. Living so, my dream life though. He's he had big time. Running an arcade. Running his arcade. He's above it. The kids are worshiping him yeah. for him beating games that he's invented. Right, right. And <laughs> then that life. and then he gets zapped by like a particle laser and thrown into the game. Yeah. And the graphics at the time. The, They're still pretty fun to watch. Very fun to watch and very, at the time, very cutting edge. Yeah. You There's know, nothing out there like this. You know, they're disqualified from the Academy Awards for special effects because computers were considered cheating. Really? Because yeah. it was that early in yeah. the process. Yeah. Do, do you know this movie was inspired by Pong? No. Yeah, the video game Pong is what initially inspired like this movie. Like, what if Pong was alive? No, literally, someone playing Pong and being like, "This would be kind of cool if, like, instead of what, instead of playing it, like, you were in the game doing." That makes Pong. sense with the high lie kind yeah, of throwing yeah, of the balls absolutely. and the discs and all. They originally were going to make this a cartoon. That would have made sense. Yeah, I mean, it kind of feels <laughs> that way, right? So this was kind of cool too. The traditional Disney animators hated this. They viewed it as being an insult to their craft. There was a divide that was created by a lot of these kind of traditional Disney animators that wanted nothing to do with computers taking. I mean, think about it, right? This is the guy working on the line at GM yeah. being like, what do you mean there's a robot that's going to do my job? Like, yeah. they, they were going to lose their job. Yeah. You know, or at least they felt they were going to at some point. It felt like it could have been made in the last 10 years kind of as a joke, though. Do you know what I mean? I, a spoof. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a little bit. I yeah. mean, it's still, you get good actors and actresses. You get it. The idea of it's very cool. Yeah. Right? This concept that they're going into a video game and from a science fiction perspective it's just fun we talked about how great science fiction movies are trying to make a bigger point yeah. this this to me feels like office space <laughs> Like the point is like screw the man, yeah. and, you know, big corporations suck, yeah. and uh, let's all just be chill and hang out. There's some profound lines though. Computers and the programs will start thinking, and people will stop. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think we're stretching. I yeah. know this is like this is like to me. I, it had to be on our top eleven. Like it's definitely one of my you know favorite sci-fi movies. Well, but we forgot one of the most important parts: the light cycles. Yes. How freaking cool are the that light is cycles? Very very. I cool. want a bar in front of me where it turns into a motorcycle, <laughs> and I love that the like the stream behind them yeah. can break people. Yeah. That's freaking awesome oh, the, that's revolutionary that it's been spoofed think about i've watched i watch a lot of cartoons with my kids yeah and uh teen titans is one of the games or one of the games Teen Titans is wild yeah so there's an episode in teen titans where this is what they do it's basically tron like it gets any movie like this that has staying power you gotta have tron on your list yeah do you know they were all in black and white outfits and they were filmed in black and white and they like put the color in afterwards? No, that's really cool. Yeah, isn't I that didn't cool? That's that very yeah. cool. All right, let's hop into our number nine film, They Live, 1988. Yes. Directed and written by John Carpenter. The God King. John Carpenter is kind of a genius. Can we go through his 80s? Yeah. The Fog, Escape from New York, The Thing, Christine, Starman, Big Trouble in Little China, Prince of Darkness, They Live. Did he have the best 80s of all time? Halloween? That's 78. 78. You do that every time. Every time. Yeah. Every time. Because there's a million of them in the 80s, too. Did he do some of the second and third ones? This is. Wait, I have to look. We'll have to check. Yeah, this is not. It's all right. It's all right. When you, when your voice gets high, you're not totally sure. What's the deal? Uh, John Carpenter. Well, let's back up because we're going to get into why I think he's a genius because I learned a lot about him when I was doing this particular movie. So they live starring uh, Roddy Piper. Roddy, Roddy Piper. Yeah. 
Keith David is Frank. Meg Foster is Holly. George Buck Flower. Oh, of course. The Drifter. We talked Wait, about this when we were doing. Is Back to the Future? Yes, that's what we were talking about. Remember Back to the Future when I was telling you he was in They, they Live? I don't remember what I had for breakfast. Yeah, that's very true. Peter Jason is Gilbert and Raymond St. Jacques as the street What's with preacher. you and all the actors this time? I just I like to throw it out there. Why not? Why not? It's not the normal you. There are. Have and, you been replaced by aliens? Yes. <laughs> so this. Let me see your face. So Roddy Roddy Piper plays John Nada and Can his. Rowdy Popper, or you have to say Rowdy every time. I have to say Rowdy Rowdy Piper every time. <laughs> it's hard to say. No, it's not Rowdy Rowdy. You, you go Rowdy Rowdy Piper. Rowdy Rowdy, Rowdy Piper. Piper, the Piper. <laughs> he plays John Nada, and he is basically a drifter. You get the impression that he had some military background. I don't know that they ever specifically say that, but really, yeah, I, I guess. get the impression he feels very like John Rambo at the beginning of this movie, right? He's just kind of <laughs> like is over. solo walking with a backpack on. I think the great part about this movie is this is one of the wow, we're going to make a statement on society movies. Like yep. they make a huge statement on society. So anyways, Mr. Piper, yep. John Nada, he's a drifter. He's looking for work and he meets our friend, Keith David, who plays Frank. Now you would know Frank from a the, bunch of movies. The thing. Yeah. Although my favorite performance of him. Requiem from a Dream? No. Um, it's terrifying. It's, yeah, my Armageddon, he's the general. He is the general. I have a better performance for you. He was in a movie called Men at Work with Charlie Sheen and Emilio Estevez. And the I Bash know, Bros. Yeah, you need to see this movie. <laughs> like, you, he's hilarious. Is he it. evil or is he good? No, he's good, but he's really funny. He's very like militant and over the top. The gap between his teeth makes him look evil at all times. I don't. That's very Michael Strahan of you, but I, I can't <laughs> tell you that I agree with that. So John Nott is a wanderer without meaning in his life. That's pretty, pretty harsh, so, okay. pretty harsh. Uh, he discovers a pair of sunglasses capable of showing the world the way it truly is. Uh, he walks the streets of Los Angeles and notices that both the media and the government are comprised of subliminal messages meant to keep the population subdued and that most of the social elite are skull faced aliens bent on world domination. With this shocking discovery, Nada fights to free humanity from the mind controlling aliens. Dum dum dum. That's the movie, right? Yeah. And he meets Frank. They form a friendship. They fight. <laughs> they fight. And it is one fight that you will never forget. Five minutes and 20 seconds of awesomeness. So, you know, in South Park, there is a fight between Timmy and Jimmy, G Timmy and Jimmy that is a scene for scene, shot for shot complete remake of the fight from They Live. Yeah. You know, this is only supposed to be 30 seconds long. No. Yeah. They went to Carpenter and they're like, we can make this better. We, yeah. can, we can go longer. Well, and Piper, with all of his you know, yeah. wrestling back, uh, all of his wrestling experience and everything, I'm not surprised he did that. They rehearsed it for three weeks in Carpenter's backyard. <laughs> That's amazing. Only, it, now, this is on the internet. It says only fake hits were the face and groin. That yeah. can't be true. They'd be I, dead. I don't know. Right? I don't know. It was, it was, a, it was a pretty intense. <laughs> <laughs> when he breaks the glass on the car, he's like, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh <laughs> or, my God. or when Frank's bottle breaks and he just laughs. Yeah. It just the, the whole <laughs> thing, the fight scene is incredible. So interestingly enough, this movie is an adaptation of a Ray Nelson science fiction short story called Eight O'Clock in the Morning, um, which was originally published in the 60s. Mm. And uh, Carpenter came across this, but his more direct inspiration was something called, uh, it was an Eclipse comic adaptation of Nelson's story. Okay. He had this story for a while. You know, this is something that he wanted to work on. And this goes back to, I was kind of speaking to the brilliance of John Carpenter. He sat down, so remember we talked about when we were discussing Big Trouble in Little China, how Carpenter did the music, like he actually like composed and did the music yeah. for Big Trouble in Little China. He did the same thing for They Live. He walked into the studio and which had a bass guitar. Had had <laughs> nothing. Had nothing planned. Yeah. Had the initial scene where uh, Piper's walking at the beginning of the movie and sat down at a keyboard and just started composing music based on the pace of his walk. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty talented, right? Yeah. Not only is he a director, but he's like putting the music to all these too. Well, and also the social commentary stuff. Like this was a direct dig at Reaganomics. It's right. Like trickle down. It's right. Like the rich don't get rich because you support them. Right. It's like this. I, this movie could come out today and be totally relevant. Oh, I'd totally be a lackey. Yeah. I'd be like, and we're all looking down at our cell phones. It would just literally, instead of them looking at TVs in the in the windows of stores, it yeah. would be everybody on their iPhone. No, I'd be the guy who's helping the aliens to, to get to get ahead. <laughs> Here's something I'm not sure that you knew that I thought was wild. The alien characters they have their communicators the pke meters. they're the pke meters from <laughs> yeah. ghostbusters which apparently that was a really frequent thing that people would use props that were built and made as a way to save on the expense of the film from other movies that's cool i thought that was wild and do you know your favorite actors in this movie who's my favorite actor tommy morrison tommy morrison tommy gunn from rocky five oh, jesus christ <laughs> he saved the resistance fighter i don't even this is I, movie premiere please move i knew on. this was gonna upset move you. on right now <laughs> i don't want to hear anything else you look like that. your head fell in a cheese dip in 1957 oh god i can't stand tommy gunn and rocky five <laughs> i wish i hadn't brought it like ruin the episode for me that you brought it up submit uh, obey. Su submit 
obey. <laughs> the special effects were great on this. Again, John Carpenter, just he's a good storyteller. And the, the, the meeting that he had originally, Roddy, Roddy Piper. Yeah. Roddy Piper had no idea who John Carpenter was. I believe that. He his agent was like, come have dinner, let's chat. And in part, him not being intimidated by him and not knowing who he was is what helped him land the role. So he was very much like, hey, can you pass the role, pass the butter? <laughs> if you look at close-ups on his face, he's got the kind of like craters on his face from like, we get we have like childhood acne and your face is kind of gruff. I didn't know that. Yeah, it, it, there's all of these elements that like Carpenter was like, this is my guy. Yeah. Like he's just this <laughs> kind of like street tough dude. Yeah. And, I, the Timberlands and jeans. Yeah, I love I love They Live. Again, this was a movie that I, in my head, I'm like, oh, it's sci-fi. It's also very much like a horror film. I mean, it's actually considered to be like a slasher horror so? film. Yeah, it's if you look at how it's uh, categorized, it's kind of designated as that. A lot of sci-fi films flip in between the two. Yeah, I'm a wimp and nothing scared me in this movie. Well, you've been desensitized. You've seen too many things. All right, let's hop on to our next movie, Max. What do we have for our next movie? Non-scary, Last Starfighter. Let's go. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> That's my terrible imitation. <laughs> We've already spent a lot of time on the show talking about The Last Starfighter because this was on our guilty pleasure list. Yeah. I love this movie. Alex Rogan. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin, right? Directed by Nick Castle. After finally achieving the high score on Starfighter, his favorite arcade game, everyday teenager Alex Rogan, played by Lance Guest, meets the gamer's designer, Centauri, played by Robert Preston, who reveals that he created Starfighter as a training ground for developing and recruiting actual pilots to help fight a war in space. Whisked away from the... <laughs> I can't even, even just like reading this is so funny to me. It's Harry Potter in space. It is. Whisked away from his trailer park life to a distant alien planet, Alex struggles to use his video game playing skills to pilot a real ship with real lives at stake. Yeah. He's the last Starfighter. Sci-fi movies, like we mentioned before, are either, you know, most of them are making these huge political statements, mm -hmm. right? But this movie is totally different. This is childhood fantasy fulfilled. Yeah. The reason that my, like my generation loves this movie in large part is because my generation was the generation that got Nintendo, that got Genesis, yeah. that was playing video games all day long. And if you're a nerd, right, like which I was, and you're sitting there in your house sweating and playing video games. Were you sweating? Maybe. <laughs> the, the idea that you could go to the arcade or the idea that you could be on your Nintendo and that somehow that would transform into you actually fighting for the world is the most incredible idea ever. Like ever. Think about it, right? Imagine like Fortnite. Right. Okay. So like, right. So today that's what this would be. Yeah. Like if you made a movie called Starfighter, but it was like Fortnite. They should do that. They should. But all these kids that are like devoting hundreds of hours a week into Fortnite, the fact that they could actually be dropped in. There's a movie coming out with uh, Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Well, he's a video game char character. Yeah, yeah. But it's like the same concept, like that you could actually be like in the game and, yeah. and human like that. Did you fantasize about this? I, I, I did. Yeah. This to me was like, this is why I love this movie so much because I spent a lot of time playing video games. If I could have just been a plumber and jumped on some like turtles, it would have made my life. <laughs> I'm like, what, what do you mean a plumber? Yeah. You're, Mario, no, you're like yeah, Mario. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's a me, Mario. That's not bad. It's, it's not, it's no walking, but um, Rylos, right? They take him to Rylos and they, <laughs> there's so many elements of this movie that are absurd. Centauri is so, absurd. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about Centauri for a moment. Um, <laughs> He's like the used car salesman version of Morpheus. Yes. That's actually a really good way of putting yeah. it. Yeah. That's actually a really good way of putting it. What do you have? I'm sure you have tons of cool stuff about this movie. What do you got? Well, I love, I love Centauri's kind of lines and all. He's like, what if the Wright brothers thought the only bird should fly? Like he's just like, he's just conning Alex into it. <laughs> you know, Zur, the evil guy was uh, almost played by Robin Williams. I didn't. Yeah. I'm not sure if he would have done a good job at it. Yeah. That's interesting. No, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Dan. Oh, Hurley, Hurley. <laughs> I can't, I'm terrible at names. You know that Dan, we'll call him Dan. Okay. Played Greg. Do you know, remember Greg? Yeah. Who so, also played his wife in the picture. Right. So funny thing about Greg, do you know who else Greg was? No. The old man from RoboCop. No way. Yeah. Dick Jones boss who, yeah. who doesn't have a name. I like, look this up. You can't find his name anywhere. They just refer to him as the old man. Yeah. But that's who also played Greg, which is a wildly different role if yeah. you think about the two. But yeah. Greg's fantastic. He is great. He's always wanted to fight a desperate battle against incredible odds. Yeah. It's that Miyagi, yeah. Daniel son kind of relationship. He's moving Alex along in the right way. Absolutely. There's so many, like the star car is basically a DeLorean. <laughs> I thought it was a Tesla. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it had the gull wings. It had like the look and feel of a DeLorean. Yeah. No. And the lizard aliens were really cool looking too. Oh yeah. The Kodan empire. Yeah. 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 When they're about to crash, it's like, what do we do? We die. This entire movie was shot in 40 days. Wow. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Cause you'd think it'd be longer, especially yeah. But the uh, the beta Alex, is that what it's called? Beta Alex? 
Oh, the clone. Yeah, yeah. They originally that was not supposed to be that big of a piece of the movie, but it tested so well that they added a whole bunch more scenes with the beta Alex for the humor element of it. It was great. It was really funny. Him and the younger brother. It's yeah. really funny. Absolutely. I love uh, the trailer park too. You don't see many things where it's like a destitute trailer park where people still have hope. Well, it's interesting because originally it wasn't supposed to be a trailer park. So Nick Castle, the director, had, I don't want to call it like an inferiority complex. I don't think that's fair. He really was trying to avoid being Lucas and Spielberg. Oh. Like they had already done E.T. They'd already done yeah. Star Wars. He wanted to do something very different. And he actually, in the DVD commentary, was saying it just goes to show how great those guys were because as much as I tried to avoid it, they just did really great stuff. But the reason they didn't do it in the suburbs is because E.T. was in the suburbs and they wanted to do he wanted to do something different yeah. and create real isolation and allow people to really associate themselves with Alex. So they you changed it. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Alex wanted out. They're uh, they're remaking this. No way. Yeah. There's actually this really cool concept trailer that's out right now. That's a bunch of drawings and it looks pretty cool. It's got the music. Dun, 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 dun. Cool. I love when. Humanity is beyond like intelligence levels, so they get crazy haircuts because they don't care. Like that white haircut, like right. Larry Moe and Curly kind right. of vibe. Yeah. I think the idea was they were supposed to look old and with age comes intelligence or something, but they were young. I, I guess the DVD. Zero is young. I, right? I haven't seen this, but I was reading up on the DVD commentary and they kind of make fun of themselves quite a bit. Like even the translator button that they put on the yeah. jacket, which like isn't there half the time and then <laughs> is there the other half of the time. So it's a wonderful movie. The last Starfighter. Yeah. Let's move from, was that number eight? Yep. God, you and numbers. numbers. Me and numbers. Uh, let's go from number eight to number seven. Logic. Uh, you love this movie. Yeah. This same, is one of your big ones. Same director. Yeah. Escape from New York. 1981, another John Carpenter movie. Max, tell me about Escape from New York. What is this movie about? Snake Plissken. Snake Pl <laughs> Named after a real guy. No way. Yeah. A friend of a friend grew up with a bully in high school whose name was Snake Plissken. Well, that guy is in jail. Snake Plissken, <laughs> who had a snake tattoo. On his tummy? I don't know if it's not tummy. <laughs> What? Okay, it's just you it's tummy, tummy tat. It's a tummy tat. <laughs> All right, sorry. Go ahead. Tell me, tat. tell me about this movie. <laughs> Snake Plissken recruited to save the president who's been kidnapped in the maximum security prison of New York City in futuristic 1997 dystopian America. The year I graduated high school. Yeah. <laughs> Has to save the president or he'll be blown up by a bomb inside of his head. There you go. Yeah. The original movie. They show a bank robbery scene at the beginning. Have you seen it? I've never. Well, not. I shouldn't say the original movie. They filmed the bank robbery scene to set up who Snake Plissken was. They didn't end up using it. It, when does, they it doesn't work. The it's, yeah. it's cool. It's but, very cool that yeah. everybody. I like the fact that everybody kind of knows who he is, but yeah. they never explain why everybody knows who he is. Do you know everyone who says, "I thought you'd be dead." ends up dying in the movie no yeah. that's funny isn't that cool there's a lot of fun kurt russell things about this movie like the studio did not want kurt russell he was a disney boy yeah they wanted uh chuck norris tommy lee jones or tommy lee jones Charles that was the Bronson other one too. Mm -hmm. so kurt russell gets this role kurt russell to this day says this is his favorite movie yeah which i think is great how, I mean, although overboard how could you say <laughs> this overboard's not your favorite but whatever that's fine you know who he based his character on no a third clint eastwood a third bruce lee a third darth vader do you know at the end of the movie uh, when he's kind of telling off the president, they wanted him to flick his cigarette at the president, but because he's such a diehard patriot that Kurt Russell refused to do it. So, so they just flicked it in the general direction of the president. So question for you. Why is the president British? That's a great question. <laughs> You're number one. You're the Duke. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't, I mean, is America that screwed? We're like, eh, let's get someone from England. I guess. I, I got the guy got rid of whatever that amendment is. Because yeah. remember when Schwarzenegger, yeah, you have to be, be natural born. Would you have voted for him? Absolutely. <laughs> I would have voted for Arnold in a, in a heartbeat. Here's a wild fact. Okay. So they had to do a lot of, uh, matte paintings for their backgrounds, right? Yeah. And one of the matte paintings, which was of New York, was drawn by James Cameron, who really? at the time who at the time was working on the crew that was helping with the effects for this movie. That's incredible. A young James Cameron painted this. James Cameron just chimes in, like the mandibles for the predator that yeah. he created. Yeah, like, he just pops up yeah. places. Isaac Hayes is great in this, by the it, way. Yeah, here's another wild fact. Are you ready? Yep. The Secret Service agent that attempts to break down the door to the cockpit of Air Force One is actually, are you ready for this? Yeah. Stephen Ford, the son of President Gerald Ford. Shut up. Isn't that wild? That is crazy. I saw that. I was like, that is absolutely wild. Absolutely wild. I'm trying to think of anything. Other, other, I have a couple cool other well, facts. You didn't talk about the cast. Like you've been talking about all these random no names and these I'll other ones. I'll get to the cast in a second. There I got a lot fans. of facts. I, there's a lot of good casts. We got casts. pretty and pink dad. We got Being a lot. Smart. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Um, you're taking your time with this I'm one. taking my time with this one. How about uh, they shot it in St. Louis and they convinced St. Louis authorities to shut off electricity to 10 blocks. 10 city blocks of yeah. St. Louis. They convinced them, shut the power down. That we need it. Wild. We need it down. I mean, that's crazy to me. Oh, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. 
The she, voiceover. Yeah, yeah. She, well, she does the voiceover and she also does the computer. And th- again, this was kind of her coming off of the heels of Halloween and, and you know, owing her career to Carpenter, which is why she was brought in. So characters. Let's go, Max. Isaac Hayes is one good one. Who oh else? Oh, my you God. Got? I love the military jacket. And also Adrian Barbeau was Maggie. Yep. That's Carpenter's wife at the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. She was great. She was very good. I felt um, really sad when she died. Harry Dean Stanton, I think you mentioned. Uh, Isaac Hayes. Brain. You got to name the brain. The brain. The brain. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the one interesting thing about this movie to me, it's almost satirical how absurd Snake Plissken's character is like his one liners, like yeah. they're, you know, him being like, uh, don't call me snake. And then and, to the and, same and guy the, later, don't call Plissken. me Plissken. Yeah. <laughs> like I just, those little things to me are hilarious. It's got almost a naked gun feel to it. Like, a little bit, I, yeah. You know, like he absurd. Puts his, he puts his feet up on the counter. Yeah. yeah. You love this movie. Yeah. Like I, I was actually surprised when we did our photo shoot that you didn't convince me to let you go get like leather pants and like a, but who would you play? Would you be Bob Hawk with the ear, I with guess. the earring? I'd probably be the president. Cool. I'd be the president. No, you'd be. Bob Hawk, you could be cool. <laughs> that is, isn't that weird though? Like he has an earring that always catches my attention. I know, right? Every time he's I'm like, like this military, yeah, like yeah. high upper, <laughs> higher up military, and he's wearing an earring. I was like Michael Jordan, a little strange. <laughs> um, anything else on this movie before we move on, Max? I thought you'd be bigger. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> that's all I got. Oh, that's all you got. I thought you'd be bigger. <laughs> oh wait, wait, no, no, one more. Thing. I thought you had one yeah. more thing. No, no. Uh, this movie in Italian was called the Hyena. The Hyena. Yeah. Okay. Don't know why. All right. In the German version, it was called the rattlesnake. Okay. Which, which makes more sense. There you go. The rattlesnake well, makes more sense. I don't know. The hyena is a little bit odd to me. It's like the Australian version, the octopus. All right, Max. We're going to go to our seventh movie. But nope. We're going to our sixth. <laughs> but before we go to our sixth movie, yeah. it's a great time Dystopian to, take, ads. To, yeah, to do some ads. Obey. <laughs> Consume. <laughs> Consume. <laughs> Buzz in the Tower is brought to you by Capsiva Pain Relieving Gel. And I can tell you that if you're sitting at a table across from a guy who has to go to the bathroom every 25 minutes, sure. you're going to get arthritis. You're going to get muscle soreness, psoriasis. Um, Capsiva is all Sorry. natural. It's okay. <laughs> Capsiva is all natural and designed to increase blood flow for the healing and pain relief process. Uh, try it for free at capsiva.com. That's C A P S I V A.com. And uh, you know, Max, I'm an old man and I need this kind of stuff. It works. It's, it's, it's great stuff. Yeah, it's like Wilford Brimley and Cocoon. You know what I mean? It's, you feel revitalized. It, that's exactly what it's like. Buzz in the Tower is also brought to you by Lindsay Larravee Photography. Uh, if you have checked out our website, hopefully you have. You've seen the amazing photos that were put up there. Lindsay, so good. Yeah, Lindsay and her team did all of those. She teased my hair. She was, she was fun to work with. Uh, just made the whole experience really exciting for us. She has been taking photos of families, children, and smiles in Metro Detroit since 2017. Um, She loves what she does, and it shows. She works with her clients, catches everything in the moment, and adores watching the connections and relationships unfold in front of her lens. If you mention Buzz in the Tower, you get $25 off any family session in 2021. You can find Lindsay on our website under our sponsors page. Uh, Check her up and get some work done. She is fantastic. Yeah, she made us look good. She can make anyone look good. I need Camp Siva. <laughs> I need Lindsay Larravee <laughs> photography. Consume. Mm. Mm, consume. <laughs> Are we ready to get to our last one on our 11 through 6? You mean my favorite movie of all time? <laughs> all right. I have to tell you, I have to give fair warning on this. I'm going to do my best to, partic- to participate. It's not that I don't like this movie. It's an hour and a half too long. No, it's too short. It's an hour and a half have too you seen long. Seven hour director. It's an that? hour. No, I haven't. It's an hour and a half too long. I know it's widely considered one of those movies that's like cherished amongst the sci-fi community. Yeah. I just I can't get into it, Max. I only like one part of it, and it's when uh, Picard. Oh, it's when the it's, movie is. It's when, the movie is. No, I'll tell you the one part I like right now. It's when Picard is playing the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only part I like. All right, fine. Patrick Stewart. You call him Picard? Uh, I do. I always call him Picard. Really? That's uh, weird. Fine, Professor X. It's yeah. when Professor Xavier Dune, nineteen eighty four. Go. Go, oh, Dune. You better. I, good luck explaining this. I want to hear you try to explain this movie to the people who've never okay. seen Dune. All right, let me stretch out. Deep, deep All breath. Right. Deep breath. <sighs> okay, it's based on the Frank uh, Herbert. I would. Novels. I'd recommend you slow down. <laughs> you're, you're. This is a lo- nice, easy. You got four hours. Yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> I already wasted three rewatching this. Based on the Frank Herbert novels, which are just known in the sci-fi community as some of the best to ever come out of any. Right. Yeah. So. Duke Leto Atreides' son leads the desert warriors against the galactic emperor and his father's nemesis when they assassinate his father and free the desert world from the emperor's rule. 
That's the general consensus of what is happening. I don't know anything you just okay, said. Okay, <laughs> so the year is 10,191. Sure. Okay. It's a good year. Hey. Lion, it, lions are going to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of Game of Thrones in space. Right. Okay. That's actually, in fairness, that's actually a really good way of explaining this. Yeah. It is very much Game of Thrones in yeah. space. Power struggles. Yep. Now, we've kind of, I love what the, makes this unique as a movie is it's that science feel that science has kind of become so innate in people. Mm -hmm. It's become religion and philosophy as science. They have this stuff called the spice, the right. melange. Right. That's on this one planet. It makes you live forever, basically. Right, right, right. And it's really hard to mine. There's sandworms and crazy stuff down there. Right. And it's basically the battle for that resource. Did Beetlejuice steal the sandworms from this? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're very similar. But continue, continue. So, it, like I said, it's that power struggle, but it's also the philosophy of trying to know yourself, understand who humanity is and who we're, we are going forward in these battles. Right. So some people are, you know, consume. Some people are the top Reaganomics, trickle-down guys. The like problem? The, like the Baron. Or there's Atreides who's trying to kind of revive the soul of humanity. The problem that I have with this movie is... It's, it's a hard one. I'm, it's the cutting in and out of like the telepathy and like hearing people's thoughts and you don't know if people are talking or not. It's three hours long, Max. The sleeper must awaken, Mo. It's, there's a lot going on. It, it's got like a crawl feel to it, which I love crawl, yeah. right? So and, and so the reason this movie... So going back to why we picked the movies we picked, we, we said that we were really going for movies that are sci-fi first and we also were avoiding fantasy movies. Like we weren't doing Masters of the Universe, even though you could say that's sci-fi, but it's more fantasy than it is sci-fi. Do is probably the exemption to this list because of you. It's because you, you is religion. Science I, has become I know, religion. I know, but it's also yeah. it's very fantasy. It's so, very fantasy. Let me ask you something. Do you like David Lynch? I feel like you're not a fan. No, I I do, I do. I just voice went up. Huh? Your voice went up. It did go up. A what do you bit. What do you like from David Lynch? Nothing. There you go. Like See, David there it Lynch. is. It's okay. <laughs> He's strange. Twin Peaks, Blue Velvet, Mahal and Drive. He's a peculiar guy. Do you know what he turned down to do this movie? What? Return of the Jedi. What? Yeah, he was offered Return of the Jedi. Oh. So, actually, in your defense, David Lynch, this is the one movie he doesn't talk about. He's not proud of it. He's you know they're redoing this right now. Oh, uh, Dennis Villanueva with the entire cast. And Bautista. Bautista, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, my God. Timothy Oliphant. Like, uh, not Timothy Oliphant. Timothy, the small guy. I don't know. <laughs> Timothy. Josh Brolin. Oh, Oscar really? Isaac. There you go. Yeah. I mean, I, I might watch the remake. I There are elements of this movie that I like, right? Do you like Sting shirtless? <laughs> He looks fantastic. Stinged. I must kill him. Isn't that wild? <laughs> yeah. I always, I'm like, that's He's good. You, when you first see it, you're just like, yeah. that's Sting. And like, it takes a minute for you to be like, that's Sting. <laughs> so do you know Patrick Stewart didn't know who he was on set? Oh, shut up. So when they said he was in the band, the police, he thought he was in a garage band with other cops. Like he was just a cop. Oh my God. That's amazing. <laughs> Patrick Stewart's great in this. Yeah. He's really good. He's kind of a butt kicking, no yeah. nonsense yeah, kind of yeah. guy, which is rare for him. Oh, I don't know, Max. Dude, you don't, you don't like Kyle MacLachlan? No, I, th there's no particular element of this movie that I like really dislike. It's just yeah. the entire movie together and a three hour adventure for it's me. It's a long, it's time. a long, it's, yeah. it, it was, I watched it. What it was about a week ago. I was watching it and I just am sitting there and I'm like having trouble focusing. I was trying to like check my cell phone while it was on connection to nature and it's kind of spiritual. All right. So Dune made you list. Are yeah. you happy? By the way, you know, who turned down Paul Atreides. No. Val Kilmer. Of course. Woo! Always Val a Val Kilmer in there. Max, have you have you exercised your dune demons or is there anything else you want to put in there before Filmed we Filmed on off? three square miles of Mexican desert that was hand cleared for two months by sure. 200 workers. Sure. Cost $40 million. Made 31. <laughs> <laughs> and do you like Beer Fest? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Baron Wolf, Wolf House, Wolfgang Von Hausen is the dad. Oh, yeah. You're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh Max, you like this too much. All right, Max. There's that, a total song in the soundtrack. I'm now. I'm pulling okay, you okay, off. Okay, I keep okay, on yeah. asking, and you keep on telling me okay. stuff I don't care about. Okay. So I'm pulling you off now. <laughs> um, we we've completed part one of the episode covering eleven through six. Solid list. I feel good about part one. Yeah. Part two is where it gets uh, into the fun stuff. <laughs> Before we conclude, now is always the perfect time for the Buzz in the Tower fan spotlight. This week's Buzz in the Tower fan spotlight is Matt, and Matt holds a very special place in my heart. He's my favorite TikTok person. He might be one of my favorite people alive. I don't know how he does anything else. He plays video games on Discord all day, and he shows cheat codes. It's Nin incredible. 1980s gamer. Look on TikTok for 1980s gamer. Look on Instagram at 1980s gamer. He summed up his love for 80s by saying one word, and that is what endeared me to him for life. 
Nintendo. Yeah. Like he loves Nintendo. Oh my God. He loves Nintendo. Like there's only a few people I know that love Nintendo the way that he does. I happen to be one of them. Like I love Nintendo and his TikTok channel. I watch his videos over and over and over again. His his excitement is unrelenting. It's 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 totally genuine. Totally. Like you get the impression when you're watching it, they're like, he doesn't care if two people watch the video (laughs) or 2 million people watch the video. 2 million people do. That's that's because he, this is kind of the cool thing about the people in our space. Right. If you love what you're talking about, like us today, we're talking about sci-fi movies. Like what a blast. And like for him, he's going to hop on and he's going to play video games and he's going to video it. Oh my and, God. Yeah. And he, it's, he's already won. Yeah. If nothing else, if nothing else comes of it, he's already winning the game. And he loves the movies, the culture. Yeah. He's like, remember these tables from the eighties? I'm like, yeah, I remember those yeah. tables. Yeah. I'm excited to hear what his pick was for yeah. his favorite eighties sci-fi. I have an idea. You do. All right. Well, let's listen to it and see. <laughs> hey guys, thanks for having me on. I love the podcast. So my favorite sci-fi movie of the eighties is an easy choice for me. It's got to be back to the future. I also think it's arguably the best 80s movie because it defines that decade. I mean, let's look at it. It was made in 1985, right in the middle of the decade, and there are so many cultural references to the 80s in this movie. Things like the DeLorean, Marty's Skateboard, and Rock and Roll. The plot is extremely clever. I love the way the same characters help to tell the story as they age through time, and the cast did a great job. I think a lot of us were so in love with that movie in the 80s because we all heard stories of the 50s from our parents when we were kids, and in the movie we got to go back in time and experience that decade too. Then we have the sequels, and I really love the second one almost as much as the first. No comment on the third one for me, but I know some people do like it. Oh, and I want to share with you guys that I'm such a big fan of the movies that I have the DVD trilogy, the DeLorean Lego set that came out a few years ago, and maybe one day I'll even get those self-lacing shoes from Nike, which actually do exist. We've all dreamed of flying cars, and at this point, I don't think we'll ever see them. So we'll just have to rewatch the movies and pretend. I, this is another one where you're going to complain and say, why did he get to pick it? And I wouldn't let you pick I'm, it. I'm a little upset. <laughs> it's a great. So like, let me, let me preface this. He's hundred percent right. Yeah. Like back to the future is one of the best eighties movies. Back to the future is one of the best sci-fi movies. We took movies out like back to the future and predator for you and I, Yeah. A, because we've already covered them a lot, but B, because we wanted to go more with sci-fi first, everything else second, but I'm not going to complain about his pick. Oh my God. He's spot on. Yeah. The I cultural mean, impact is yeah. just crazy. And, and just as it, when you think 80s sci-fi, I mean, how how can you not treat, unless you're Mo and Max, how can you not treat yeah. the Back to the Future like it's not 80s sci-fi? If he gets self-tying laces, I'm going to get them too, and we're going to FaceTime and self-tie them together at the same time. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I'm excited to watch that video. Uh, <laughs> closing out. Closing out on that note. Uh, Matt, you're my hero. No, it's great. It's great. Uh, next week's episode, part two, we're going to go over our top five. We've covered 11 through six. We'll cover five through one. Uh, and you should tune in because it's going to be a great, great show. All Three hours of just doing stuff. No, we were doing's done. So be excited about next week. A reminder uh, our YouTube channel is up and running. It's so cool. Go to our website and click on the YouTube link or go to YouTube and search Buzz in the Tower. And we're, of course, on all other social media channels. You can find us at Buzz in the Tower. And uh, yeah, like, subscribe, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, follow, review. subscribe, share the love. Tell people about us. If you like what you're listening to, call up that old friend from high school you haven't spoke to in a while and let him know, hey, you guys got to check out Buzz in the Tower. Yeah. Or if you know Tom Cruise, call him up. Yeah, like, that'd be listen. great. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Someone out there might know Tom Cruise. I don't. I, Tom Cruise is, he's a little bit interesting. We're called Buzz in the Tower. I know. So, so go get Val Kilmer. Fine, why, why, are you, why are you not telling people to get Val Kilmer? <laughs> All right. Uh, Max, I got nothing else. You want to end on a sci-fi note for this particular episode, part one? I don't know. <laughs> in, in space no one can hear you podcast yeah. how about that no no, no. Uh, when it is gone there will be nothing only I will remain is that Dune yeah of course it is Dune on that note Max <laughs> Captain's Log Captain's Log 25784 uh, alright well I will see you next week when we do part do Woo. we should call it Hot Shots part do you, you like doing this I do like doing that <laughs> alright talk to you next week You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.